Grace Bible Church. Um, if you want to stand, if you want to start making your way back to your seats, start our service. Two, three. be seated. Good morning, everybody. Hope you like the song. The band just wrote that for you today. Brand new. Not true. Hey, if you're visiting today, obviously we'd like to welcome you to our service and hope that uh, you are made to feel loved and welcome because you certainly are. We have more detailed information about all the announcements that I'm going to give you today in our news, that a newsletter that's at the information table in the back. And if you are visiting, we would love for you to be placed on our information list so that we can email you announcements and so on each week and uh, you can receive that newsletter on a weekly basis. We have three groups that help out with our uh, young adults and they are called Quench, Lifeline, and Level Up. That's for our youth ministries and college age. They're going to be meeting today after church with pizza. Paul and Melody. Where are Paul and Melody? Would you stand up? They lead our junior high group, Quench, and then Seth leads our high school group. Thank you, Seth. And James is responsible for our college age, so level up. So thanks, everybody. Christmas pictures will continue to be taken after services today and again next Sunday from 9.15 to 10.15 and then from 11.45 to 12.30. Please sign up for a time slot at the information table if you are interested in that. And we're going to use these to update our pictorial directory. If you're not currently in the church directory, we'd love to get you in there. And if you'd leave your contact information at the information table and then sign up for next week. Uh, or if you'd like to provide a picture um, to Julie, we would appreciate that. Thanks to everyone who participated in the Assure Women's Center Adopt a Family Ministry the last few weeks here. Today's the deadline for the return of all the items, and Becky can help you with questions. Becky, say hi. Okay. Hey, we had a card writing uh, party, a fellowship that uh, was a good success. We had 21 people there, and we wrote 125 cards that evening. It was a good start to the new ministry that we're having about a quarterly letter writing fellowship. If you'd like to participate in that, it really is simple. All the materials are provided, the information, addresses, everything's provided for you. And there's general 
uh, address list that's still available on the Vital Signs Ministries website. Addresses for our GBC missionaries and those who have been absent from our fellowship uh, were not publicly printed, but you can get a copy from Claire. Claire, would you wave or stand up back there, please? Thank you very much. Seems for a Cause will meet next Saturday, the 12th, from 10.30 to 4 at Kristen's for a light lunch at 12.30 and then Christmas cookies. Please see Paula. Paula, where are you? Paula will help you if you'd like to have your details emailed in the supply list. The ladies have a table set up today where you can stop by on your way out back there. So it's got a great ministry. Seems for a cause. Next Sunday is our Children's Ministry Christmas program. Practice for that is going to continue today. Also, our Christmas Eve service, as you might guess, on the 24th at 6 p.m., and a sign-up sheet for cookies and cider will be out shortly. So, those announcements. Some birthdays. Laura Graves on the 9th of December. Jacob Hansen is on the 10th of December. So sad they're enjoying the sunshine down in Mexico. No anniversaries. Uh, say, most of you know that we don't take up a formal offering. We do have a white box in the back if you'd like to contribute. Uh, we've been a little bit behind in our giving recently and we sure would appreciate help with that. Also, if you'd like to give on a more regular basis, uh, like Cheryl and I have it just deducted right out of our account. We have Venmo, all kinds of ways for you to, to do that. Now, Rick Renicar, where are you, Richard? Come over here, will you please? Uh, I'd like to make an announcement this morning. It is a long walk, is it not? It is for old people. Yeah. Well, then I can appreciate that. <laughs> okay, I lost the toss today, and uh, instead of Dave doing the announcements, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to handle this one. Um, uh, back on, uh, I think it was November 15th, on a Sunday, Dave uh, announced that we were going to add a, another elder, and uh, we've gone through that process, and uh, we, we told the body that... Um, We'd give you two weeks to come up with any concerns you might have, and we did not anticipate that, and uh, it did not happen because we have a really good good candidate. So uh, anyway, this is uh, Jason Plummer. Wh where is Jason anyway? Is he? There he is. So Jason is our, our new youngest elder. Uh, he, Dave used to be our youngest elder, but he has to hand off to Jason for that. And... Uh, so, uh, yeah, Jason's our new elder, um, but we also have uh, our pastors, um, you know, he's always been on our leadership team, and, uh, and for quite a bit of that time, he was an elder, but f a couple years ago, a little bit longer than that, he, uh, he stepped off for, uh, for a while, and, uh, but we're going to, uh, it, it was a split vote, but we're going to reinstate uh, Pastor Dan as, as an elder again, so... Uh, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he he uh, he squeezed by, and so he's going to join us. But Dan's always been on the leadership team, and of course, we uh, very much value his leadership and uh, input on all that. So, so to go over, um, yeah, we've got uh, in in order of age, we got Jason, and uh, then we got Dave Slusiger and and uh, Russ Jansen back there. And then uh, our pastor, and then your eldest elder, and that would be me. So uh, there, there's five of us. So uh, got anything to add? That's it. <laughs> it was expensive to get back on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. All right. <laughs> the kids are going to be dismissed to a music practice for their program as soon as they've gone through the communion line today. And for those of you that are visiting, I want to take a moment to explain our procedure on Sunday mornings. This is different than some, but for us, uh, we, as we understand the New Testament, on a regular basis, their church service actually was uh, the Lord's Supper, was an actual meal. Now, in America, we've kind of ad adjusted that policy. And for our Sunday morning services, for now, that's what we've done as well. So we break bread at the beginning of service, as they did then they would have a meal, some instructions, some music, and they would close with the cup. So we do begin with the bread. And Paul said, Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, it's good to examine yourself before you take the bread. Now, if you don't know you have everlasting life, 
we'd consider it a great privilege to be able to talk to you about that and tell you in a very simple, short manner how you can have eternal life. If you do, this is a great time as a believer to take that minute to just ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything between you and me that I need to get right? When you do, it's a great chance to confess that sin and to enjoy God's ongoing forgiveness in your life. So we're going to take a moment before, to uh, pray silently before we take the bread together. And I wonder if you'd join me in that as we do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to examine our hearts today, to make sure we're ready to take the bread, and also, Father, to be taught and to worship you. I pray for the music team today that you give them grace as they lead us before the throne that way. And I pray that as we look at your word, there'll be clarity, there'll be accuracy, and you'd grant wisdom to reject anything that is not biblical. Honor yourself, Father, and thank you so much for the reminder once again that we're here because of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to ask that those that are involved in the children's ministry will go through the lines first, and the men will show you, will direct you to the table uh, row by row. Gentlemen. Thank you, Allie. Jack Nicholson is in a movie, it was called, uh, was in a movie called As Good As It Gets. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, but Jack Nicholson in that movie has a real problem with OCD to the point where it's handicapping his life. And he meets a young lady, quite a bit younger than him, Helen Hunt, and he has a problem being self-absorbed, and she wants Jack to give him a compliment, give her a compliment. And Jack said, I can do this. I can do this. I can come up with a good compliment. And so as they're sitting at the table, uh, he starts telling her the story of how he got to the place of complimenting her. (laughs) And he goes on a tangent, and Helen gets understandably frustrated because once again, he's off and running. And he stops and he says to her, he looks at her, and in one of the great scenes in movie history says, You make me want to be a better man. And Helen, who throughout the movie has been frustrated with Jack Nicholson's character and his OCD, just has this wonderfully stunned look on her face. And she said, that's maybe the best compliment that I've ever given, that I've ever been given. Do you know it's interesting because he stole my line. Do you know that um, my background is very different than Cheryl's? And our family was very different than Cheryl's family. Some in some ways good, in some ways uh, not so good. But you know that uh, I am, whether I'm right or wrong, I'm 100% convinced that I would not be in the ministry today. I certainly would not be where I am spiritually if it wouldn't have been for my wife. Because I can say with 100% honesty before everybody here, she makes me want to be a better man. And do you know that's what marriage is supposed to be? I want to caution you about something. I want to caution you about letting the world shape your view of the relationship between a man and his wife. Because in my judgment, the world is trying very hard to make relationships between men and women be a competition. I think it's one of the things that's almost killing our nation. The reality is what God had intended all along for marriage to be would be a cooperation. See, in the garden... When Adam and Eve lost the right to rule, when they were expelled from the garden, what God had in mind all along was for men and women to complement and balance each other, to be co-regents in the kingdom of God. And what we've been looking at in Ephesians is a book that talks about spiritual warfare 
And as it talks about this spiritual warfare, he starts off in the first half of the book telling you who you are in Christ, what God has done for you. And he wants you to know that God chose the church to occur before the foundation of the world. And he explains that God gave every single person in the church an unconditional inheritance to reign with Christ. That we were dead. And just like he did with Jesus, he made us alive and raised us up and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ. He wants us to be amazed at the grace of God because that's where the verse comes in, for by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, that no one should boast, that no one should boast. And the church was created to produce good works. And then he tells in chapter 3, an ex, or chapter 2, an extended account of what he did to create the church and how he made this new entity and how he brought Jews and Gentiles to gather in the body of Christ. And he talks about how that even though the plan of Satan was to kill Jesus Christ, the plan of God was when Israel failed to bring a new entity to gather called the church. And dwelling in us is the Holy Spirit of God who's a guarantee of what is to come. And when he ends that first section, Paul's mind is blown by the unbelievable grace and kindness that the Lord has shown us. In chapter four, he says, okay, now you need to live out, live worthy of the calling that God has called you with. And so he gives the church all these wonderful to-do lists to live right. And now when we come to chapter five, he basically says this, when we live as a servant in our relationships, we make life better for others and ourselves, both now and in eternity. When we live as a servant in our relationships, we make life better for others and for ourselves, both now and in eternity. And men and women, this is a passage that is, uh, contains some commands that when they're taken separately, are two of the most difficult things to hear in the whole Bible. They're not very pleasant. When they're taken together, the two of the most beautiful commands in all the Bible. But it's a very misunderstood and distorted section of Scripture. So I want to talk to you about the context. As we lead up to this, what we've seen in chapter 5 is this. Paul tells us to act like God, to love like God. And the next thing he says is to watch out for the bad guys because if you hang out with the sons of disobedience, you hang out with the sons of disobedience, they could cause you to lose your conditional inheritance. See, there is an unconditional inheritance for all believers. But we can enhance our eternal relationship with God. But that's conditional. Co-heirship with Christ is conditional. And he's saying, watch out because they could cause you to lose all of that extra that you can have with Jesus. So, he said, this is the best lifestyle. I'm trying to teach you what the best lifestyle is to get you the best reward in eternity. And so he says this, basically, in Ephesians 5. Let the Spirit of God fill you with God's Word. And as the Spirit fills you with God's Word, you're going to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts, always to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. So there are three great results from letting the Spirit of God fill you with His Word. There's joy, there's thankfulness, and there's a mindset that impacts others. This is where we're being so sold short, men and women. This is where the danger is. We can help one another in the spiritual battle, and we can earn our inheritance, a greater inheritance in the kingdom. So here's what Ephesians says, last part before this. Don't be wise, but understand what the will, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, it's excess, it's, you go in the wrong direction. It's a bad lifestyle. But, be filled, and I would translate, be, uh, I, I believe it should be translated, be filled by the Spirit, because if it's with, it's the only place in the New Testament it's this way. Be filled by the Spirit, and I think he's talking about with the Word, Colossians 3 tells us that. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then watch this, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Isn't that interesting? My relationship with the Lord is supposed to impact the way I treat other people. All of us are supposed to have a mutual submission. Now, what God has done is that he has set up relationships in life 
that order our world. And you're familiar with a lot of them, and he's going to talk about them. But he says, I want there to be a mutual submission in the body of Christ. You need to ask yourself, how can I make this person's life more successful spiritually? So let's talk about the example of Jesus. And I'm going to go a little quickly here because we touched on this last week. But I want to remind you that this lifestyle was the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. So what kind of a person does God call great? What kind of a person does God call great? He talks about servants and servant leaders. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to look at, and that's been missed. Here's, you remember where mommy of James and John comes to Jesus, says, grant that my son can sit on your right hand and left. I want my sons to have the best places in the kingdom. And Jesus says, well, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Will you be baptized with the baptism with which I'm about to undergo? And they said, yeah. So, okay, you're gonna go through it. But I can't tell you who's going to get the positions of authority. My father will decide that. It's earned, the old-fashioned way. And the ten heard it, it says, and they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Why? Are they going to get something that I'm not going to get? But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. When you have authority, the Gentiles use it to push people around, to bully people. And those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What Paul is encouraging in this passage is exactly what Jesus did for us. How can it be wrong? He talks about servants and servant leaders. He says, you want to be great, you serve others. He does this in Philippians as well, and we touched on this last week. I got to go back to it because Jesus humbled himself and gave us an example. Are we willing to be countercultural enough to follow his example? Because if you're going to be a servant today, you're countercultural. Here's what it says. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. This is from the New American Standard this time. But with humility, consider yourselves one another as consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, I like this translation. New King James says, "Let this mind be in you." I like this translation. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who. As, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. What he means is he didn't hold on to it. He didn't hold on to it. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. Now, as you know, the verses that go on after this talk about because of that, God highly exalted him. But today I want to focus on the fact that Jesus Christ gave the example of what we're talking about today to all of us. There's nothing Paul's asking you to do that Jesus hasn't done. So there are three relationships that illustrate submission. For those of you that have notes, you have them in your notes. Ephesians 5 says, and this is a long section, but it's important that we read it and that we read all of it. Because isolated, these commands are irritating. Together, they're beautiful. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let their wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, those three verses, while the men are dancing, those three verses are written to the wife. Now, he shifts his attention to the men, and it's considerably longer. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. And looking at some of us men, I would say, we really love our bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Do you notice, gentlemen, that we're given two different perspectives? 
Wives, respect the fact that God has decided to give your husband a position in the home. And then he says, guys, I want you to create an environment that makes her role easier. I want you to love her the way I've loved you. Notice he says, verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you, so in particular, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he'll receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. And you masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. Now, obviously, when we talk about that last relationship, we're talking about the Roman world. There were three different periods of uh, where bondage was uh, strong. One was in the Jewish period, and that situation of a servant master was very different than the Roman period, which is what Paul's talking about, and that's very different than the American period. It's not even close, so be careful not to connect those words with one another. Here's the bottom line. Satan wants relationships to improve, comp to uh, involve competition. God wants relationship to involve cooperation. So when he says submitting to one another in the fear of God, there are three examples he gives here. Husbands and wives, parent, child, servant, master. God uses relational structures in life. We're going to talk about that, but he uses relational structures to accomplish his will. And in this book, he's talking about inheriting in the kingdom. And he's talking about spiritual warfare. And he's saying, as part of spiritual warfare, you need to conduct yourselves properly in these relationships. Submit does not mean to obey in this context. If we're supposed to submit to one another and these relationships indicate mutual submission, if the parent is supposed to obey the child, are the, are the child supposed to obey the parent? Are the parents supposed to obey children too? That's not what he means. He's talking about mutual submission being bi-directional. It's to subject oneself. So wives respect their husbands as head. The husband sacrificially loves his wife as Christ loved the church. Children obey and honor their parents the parents train, don't exasperate children. We're going to look at this more in Colossians here. Slaves serve as to Jesus, and the masters don't threaten because you're going to be judged at the Bema seat. In all of these, it is better to make the position, not the person, our focus. So, Ephesians 5, it commands submission to one's husband as part of her submission to the Lord. In other words, it's not a command to submit to one's husband to the degree that she submits to the Lord. God, not the husband, has recourse for the wives who reject it. It's not the husband. There's no, uh, there's no enforcement clause given to the men. It's not really your job. In fact, I would say to everybody here, if God has you in a particular relationship, you should not focus on what the other person is doing. That's a huge downfall. It's not your business. They, the Lord takes care of that. The husband is to create an environment where she is comfortable submitting. Remember, I talked to a young lady one time when we were talking about in premarital counseling, and she was really taken aback by this whole thing, understandably. And I said, look, I have a question for you. If you're in an environment where your husband on a regular basis is loving you as Jesus Christ loved the church, is that in your mind a bad thing? She got a huge smile on her face, and she said, that sounds just wonderful. It just sounds wonderful, and it should be. The husband is to be a servant leader. I know it's depressing. See, uh, I want to suggest to you that the reason God gives the commands he does to different individuals is because we don't do them well. Men don't lead well. Now, I didn't say men aren't willing to run things. <laughs> I didn't say men aren't willing to be bosses. 
I said men don't, don't lead well by nature. Why does he command a husband to love his wife? Because nobody loves their wives the way they're supposed to, the right way. Are you tracking with me? I'm not saying you don't feel things about your wife. I'm not saying you don't like her. I'm not saying there aren't things. What I'm saying is none of us love our wives the way we're supposed to. That's why it has to be commanded. Ditto for the wife and her role. And so, some clarity from Colossians. This might help clear some things up here. So, wives, notice it's, brief, it's briefer, and he gives emphases here he doesn't give elsewhere. Watch. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wife, and do not be bitter toward them. Ladies, you ever ask this question? Why would a husband be angry and bitter at his wife? Because she might be making his role more difficult. Now, I happen to have a wife that consistently makes my life a lot better, makes me want to be a better man. And he's saying, don't be bitter toward her. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing, what? To the Lord. I want you to notice, we are constantly redirected to the Lord in all this. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. If you're a heavy-handed father, it makes it more difficult for your children to obey. How does a parent submit to a child? He makes it easier for the child to obey. See, parents, with your children, those of you that have multiple children, I want to give you a suggestion. The Bible says, train up a child in the way in which he should go. And in the Hebrew, it means according to his way. The job of every parent is to ask themselves, what is this child like? Because God has a great sense of humor. And any of you that have multiple children know that. How many times have you parents said, how in the world did this child get born into this family? It's 180 degrees different. And one child comes out and says, Mom, Dad, how can I make you happy? And the next child says, how can I mess up everything that child wants to do? The difference is amazing in our children. All three of our children were dramatically different. Our job as parents is to say, what, how can I help this child get by? And if you have a one-size-fits-all mentality with your children, you're going to say, I don't understand why I have so much trouble with this kid. Well, it may be because that kid has so much trouble with this parent. And so our job as parents is to say, Lord, give me wisdom with this child. I remember with, with one of our children, uh, they, at one time they don't anymore, did not at all, but they, one, one of our kids drew a picture and it was just, it looked, it looked like a snapshot and he was eight years old. And I said, this is fantastic. How'd you do this? He said, oh, I just drew it. And I said, no, I know you drew it, but how did you draw it? I meant, how did you trace it? Oh, I just drew it. And I started getting a little bit irritated. I said, no, son, I know that you didn't just sit down and draw this freehand. Yeah, yeah, I did. Now my wife is off to the side thinking, we've got a prodigy. This is great. Our son's a genius. He's an artistic genius. And dad's different. And I said, son, listen, I want to be clear here. I know you didn't draw this freehand. How did you draw this picture? He starts crying. Why won't you believe me? My wife is thinking, honey, believe him, believe him. And I said, son, I'm going to give you one more chance. Because you're eight, you want to be nine someday. <laughs> How did you do this? And he said, I just drew it, Dad. I had a revelation. I grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil. I said, do it again. And don't you know that little guy sat there and tried to do it, and finally he broke down in tears, and he said, I'm lying. <laughs> But you know what? He asked me one time, how come I, my siblings don't get disciplined the way I do for lying? I said, because they don't have the problem you have. You know, he's one of the most honest kids in the world today. He, he, that was it, man. From, from then on, he was great. We could trust him. But you need to know your children. How do I raise this kid? What's best for him? And for one, you may need to get really tough. I was talking to Coach Brown about coaching players. And he said, you need to know your players. You need to know how to discipline them. He says, with one player, you get in their face. What's wrong with you? You need to be tougher. You can't, every time you little nick, you can't come off the field, you gotta get tougher. He said, with other players, he said, you'll devastate them. And those of you that coach know this, right, Coach? With some of you, you gotta put their, your arm around them and say, Hey, man, great job out there. No, you're really giving all. But listen, you need to do this better. But that's the way it is. That's how God disciples us, and that's how you work with your children. Don't discourage them. I wish I knew this a long time ago. 
Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart fearing God. Now, today I don't want to go into the difference in this. This is, again, this is different than what it was in America. And, of course, we're free to destroy a system we think is horrible. But at the time, he says, whatever you do, watch. Do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Number two, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. Do you notice that? I suggested to you chapter one, unconditional inheritance. But do you notice here we're talking about a con- a re- inheritance that is earned. It's a reward for your behavior. For you serve the Lord Christ. Don't make people the issue in these relationships. He who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done and there's no partiality. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair. Why? You've got a master in heaven. And if you're not a servant leader, I know how to, God knows how to deal with you. So, some more illustrations. I should have left that one there. If you've ever had s'mores, it's just worth an illustration. So, here's some new ones. Submitting to one another in the fear of God, illustrations and applications that are not given here. Teacher-student is an application. We told our children, you know, if, if you think your teachers are wrong, let us deal with it. You respect them. You, you know, be good to them. Government citizen, and so uh, law enforcement is, is an authority in our lives. Can we disagree? Sure. Can you disagree and say, I'm, I'm going to disobey and take the consequences, submit that way? Sure you can. But in general, the rule is obey, honor, honor law enforcement. Elder congregation. The Bible goes into great lengths about this, by the way. In Hebrews 13, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they give watch over your souls. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you, he says. And an employee or employee doesn't talk about work relationships, but. So what comes next? Why do you choose to submit to others? Why do you choose to honor them by making their roles easier? Why do you do that? Well, because God wants you to. Because God commands you to submit to one another in the fear of God, because it's best for others. See, this is what Jesus did. And if you're put off by this, that's what he did. Now again, all the relationships, like we talk about the, the servant and the, the, uh, uh, their, those that they were responding to back then. That's, that, th- those, there's, you can change institutions. And theirs was not like ours. They, ours. The situation here was horrible, just horrible. And of course we oppose it. But Paul was talking about their system there. It's best for others. It's best for you because of the natural inclinations he addresses that we face. For example, I want to talk to you again about this parent-child situation. Children are born sinners. I know that's a shock to your system. If you don't believe that, have kids. (laughs) Second, children need to learn about sin. If you never discipline your children, if you never point that out to them, they think that they become entitled, have a sense of entitlement. Are you tracking with me? They have a sense of entitlement. They need to learn about authority. Your children need to learn about authority. They need to learn about consequences. They need to learn, I do things wrong, I'm accountable to authority, and there's consequences if I don't do things the right way then they are ready for another word. It's called grace. And I remember very clearly one time our kids had done something wrong. And as I talked to the kids, they knew they should be disciplined. And this was the first time in their lives, maybe, later in their lives, I said, this is what you deserve. I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to give you this. And I taught them about grace. So servants and servant leaders is what Paul is talking about. Here's a question I have for you today. If it was good enough for Jesus, is it good for us? Or are we better than the Lord Jesus Christ? Jack Nicholson said to the lady he was dating for all his weaknesses, he said, you know, you make me want to be a better man. When we live as a servant in our relationships, we make life better for others, We make life better for ourselves, both now and in eternity. Jack said, you make me want to be a better man. That's a good lesson for us to learn as to what's really important. 
men and women, this is a, this is a situation, especially when you deal with the husband-wife relationship, children to parents, and when it extends to our workplaces, when it extends to other relationships, these are difficult things. You know, when a police officer, if a police officer pulls you over for speeding or something like that, the Bible isn't say you regard him as better, as superior. The Bible is, say, is saying respect his position. That's the point. And we can act in a way, if we'll have the right attitude, we can act in a way that can make their life better. Do you know that uh, there have been times that I have uh, gotten in trouble for something? I remember when I was in college, I did something kind of dumb. And I ended up talking to a police officer. And, and uh, I, I, I always try to, sir or ma'am, whatever the case might be, to treat them with respect. And the guy, it was, it was one of the only tickets I received in my whole life. <laughs> That's a long story. I was goofing around one time. And I remember sitting in his car with him and talking, and he said, you know, if I'd had a chance to talk to you before, I'd never have given you a ticket. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute. But anyway, <laughs> people appreciate being treated with respect. And that's what Paul is saying. Make sure that you honor the position and not necessarily the person. And there may be people at your job where you say, man, I can't stand my boss. They're still in a position where you can show respect. Now, God has given us the freedom. Early, we talked about something. God has given us the freedom to change things if we want. So, for example, the institution we had in America in the 1800s, we said, this is wrong, it's sinful. We changed it. We have that right to do it, and we were right to do it, right? But in the, in the situation that it, with a parent-child, probably hard to undo that one. And the Bible says that if you honor your parents, I'm going to honor you. The Bible says that we're free, for example, to seek a new job if we want. But as a student, we honor the authorities above us. Uh, all the way down the line, God has set up these relationships. And here's the bottom line today. We are moving toward the kingdom of God. And as we move toward the kingdom of God, there are spiritual battles that go on in families. Do you, not, do you know not every husband and wife always get along? Do you know that parents and children don't always get along? But whether that's true, what, whatever is true in that relationship, God is saying, this is the way I've structured things and I want you to honor my structures because Satan, this is what we're looking at next week, men and women. Next week, we're gonna get into the spiritual battles in the heavenly places where demons are working today to disrupt our lives. And they're gonna disrupt it here. And what Paul is saying is, these are the best relationships that you can have. This is the way I want relationships conducted so that as you're on your way to the kingdom, husbands, make sure that you're loving your wives the way I've loved you, that you're willing to die for them, that you cherish them, that you nourish them. This is the attitude I want you to have. But my wife, I don't care about what your wife is doing. I want you to do what I tell you to do. And if you're out of step with that, you're making it more difficult for you and for her to inherit what Paul calls the reward of the inheritance. And so this is how God wants us to conduct ourselves on our way to the kingdom, in spiritual warfare, have these attitudes so that you can make it easier on others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be held on to. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, uh, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and earth and under the earth, and that every knee should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The man's gonna come up and lead us in our worship would you join me in a word of prayer as we close today? Our Father, these are hard things. I, as you know, I fail dramatically as a husband oftentimes. And it's hard to look at myself when I do. And Father, I pray that you give all of us the grace to submit to one another, to make life easier for one another, to make relationships that you've structured workable so that we'll enjoy your protection on our way to the kingdom of God, inheriting with you. In Christ's name, amen. If you'd like to stand with us, let's worship.
We're going to take a moment to end our service with the cup today and to remember what Christ has done for us. You know, coming up to this message, I said to the Lord, boy, I, I really don't even know how to present all this because it's so counterculture to today. And I just want to encourage your hearts that, that properly understood these are great, great truths. And as I said before, some of these things, if you isolate one from the other, they're horrible. Taken together, it really creates a beautiful home environment, creates a beautiful environment for life in general. This is the system that God uses and he works through it to strengthen us. Let's take a moment to uh, have a word of prayer as we consider the cup today and what Christ has done for us. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the new covenant that was made for us in Jesus Christ, that it is permanent, that through this new covenant that we celebrate in the cup, we can know you, we can have a permanent relationship with you, and Lord, that we have an inner inclination to obey and complete forgiveness of sins. So as we celebrate this cup, Father, I pray that we will honor you and remember your son. In Christ's name, amen. Guys. If you'd like to sing, we have one more song. Oh, come, all ye 